So welcome, welcome everybody to our Pacifos Canada live uh, building conversations webinar. So glad you're able to join us today. Uh, we're just waiting to see, uh, most people are just joining in now. So uh, we're gonna get started right away. Uh, my name is Deborah Knopp and I'll be your moderator for today's meeting. We've got a 60 minute session here, which is going to consist of about 45 minutes of engaging conversation. And then we have about a 15 minute for a Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the reins over to our CEO, Chris Ballard. Chris. Well, good morning, everyone. And so, uh, so glad to uh, have you here joining us. Let me just uh, share my screen and then we'll, uh, We'll get events underway, one second. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, as I was saying, uh, it's so great to have everybody here today. Thank you for your time. Uh, really excited about today's presentation. And uh, without uh, further ado, let me get into it. I wanna take uh, uh, just a couple of minutes to tell you uh, a little about Passive House and a little about uh, uh, Passive House Canada. Uh, it's sort of our infomercial, and we'll do that before we get to uh, to our exciting guest today uh, with uh, Arn uh, from Diamond Schmidt Architects. So a little bit uh, first about Passive House Canada. Well, who are we? We're a membership-based social enterprise. Uh, we do uh, primarily advocacy, education, and professional development. Uh, we provide technical services to uh, to our members and to the greater uh, uh, Passive House community. Uh, we have members and staff and instructors located all across Canada. I'll tell you the one thing that I have found, and any of you who are uh, members of the Passive House community will no doubt agree, this is a group of people who, uh, who are doers. They're the ones who roll their sleeves up and they are designing and building uh, passive houses all across the, this country. Uh, and the thing I find really interesting is they, they're, they're they love to share and they love to problem solve. So by day, we may have a ferocious competition uh, between uh, organizations, but it's amazing. You know, after hours over a coffee or something stronger, uh, I find uh, Passive House people are putting their heads together to solve common problems. So if you're not a member of Passive House Canada, I'd encourage you to join or at least uh, sign up for our free newsletter, come out to our social events and meet other Passive House practitioners. Um, our mission three point, we're here to, to make zero emission buildings known and adopted by government, industry, and the public. Uh, we support government and industry in the transition to high performance buildings. We do that through education, certification, and policy development. Um, and we promote the Passive House Institute building standard because it's frankly, globally recognized as the best building standard for zero emission buildings. So those are the three things that we're involved with day to day. So today's guest is uh, Arne Saraga of, of Diamond Schmidt Architects. Uh, and in a few minutes, I'll get uh, Arne to turn his camera and uh, on and, and we'll have a, a great conversation. But uh, Arne, uh, uh, he has his Master of Architecture degree from U of T. He's been with Diamond Schmidt since uh, 2013. He's done a, a variety of projects from temporary pavilions to uh, multi-tower developments. But um, you know, one of the things I find most fascinating about him is uh, uh, the, the sustainable objectives. Uh, it's, a, it's a foundation of the work that he's doing. So we'll learn more about that and more about Diamond Schmidt in the... Uh, in the uh, minutes ahead. So I want to take a couple of minutes just to talk about uh, the, uh, the world today, primarily in Canada, uh, to talk about uh, Passive House and the role it plays in addressing the climate crisis. Why are most of us here doing the things that we're doing? The key driver for Passive House, quite frankly, is in, is in reducing Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we can see, we have to have a chart, I know, uh, we can see that uh, that we haven't been doing a great job of it in Canada. Uh, I was delighted to hear uh, the government announced today 
that uh, it is uh, uh, targeting a 40% reduction in GHGs over 2005 for 2030. It was 30%. Monday's budget moved it up to 36. Today on Earth Day, the Prime Minister announced that's going to 40%. That's wonderful. Um, but we know that about 53% of Toronto's and 52% of uh, Vancouver's GHG emissions come from buildings. Nationally, it's a little over 30%. So zero emission buildings are really important uh, to, to helping Canada reduce those emissions. Um, we know about uh, the, the, how much energy our buildings in Canada require. If we look at uh, this uh, inventory from 2019, um, we can see that space he heating alone, uh, 203 uh, kilowatt hours per square uh, meter is our commercial, 121 for uh, the average residential. We can see uh, in the red, the 15 is passive house. So passive house building principles have a lot to offer in reducing uh, Canada's GHG emissions. Uh, moving ahead, uh, we have the uh, uh, pan-Canadian framework. People should recognize, and I'm sure all of you are on today's webinar because you know that um, uh, moving to zero emissions is not theoretical. It's not something that may have happened, that uh, because of the can, uh, pan-Canadian framework, all the provinces and territories have signed on to make this reality uh, by uh, you know, net zero energy ready by 2030, uh, and uh, 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 zero by 2050. So this is in the works. Uh, this is happening. Part of the work we do at Passive House Canada is, is working with governments on policy to uh, be better prepared for 2030 and uh, 2050 um, to uh, monitor and make input on the, the, the harmonized national building code. All of those things uh, impact the the day to day work of uh, of, of uh, uh, members of Passive House Canada. So moving along, uh, for those who are new to Passive House, what is a Passive House building? What makes it passive? You know, frankly, from the outside, it looks like any other building, but inside, it really is a different world. If you've not had the opportunity to visit a Passive House building. When the pandemic is over, uh, I would invite you to join us for our Passive House days uh, when people throw open uh, both commercial and residential space to have you visit. So uh, keep an eye on our website for that, hopefully this fall. Um, but these buildings are anything but passive and uh, Passive House is more than houses. Uh, it's passive only in that the, the building envelope does the majority of the work uh, to maintain the comfortable temperature inside. Uh, there are five principles to passive house building. Uh, one is that there is super insulation. The second is that we have airtight construction. Uh, the third is thermal bridge free. Uh, there's nothing that penetrates the structure to allow uh, cold from the outside to work its way to the inside, that we have high quality windows with solar orientation, uh, and that there is a ventilation system with heat recovery. If you're going to have that airtight construction, you absolutely have to make sure that you've got a really good ventilation system with heat recovery. Um, why build to the Passive House standard? Well, when you do, you get healthy indoor air quality, you get greater comfort, uh, you get durability of build, the quality assurance in a passive house construction uh, is much higher. Obviously, you get energy efficiency, you get GHG reductions, that means cost savings. Part of what I have a lot of fun talking about is our ancestry, passive house ancestry. It really has uh, Canadian connections, Canadian roots, Canadian DNA. Uh, we have the Saskatchewan Conservation House is the prime example, built in 1977, a project between government of Saskatchewan, government of Canada. Uh, it was during uh, uh, a late 70s oil embargo and governments were concerned about how people in a cold climate were going to stay warm in the wintertime if the oil taps uh, were turned off. Um, this uh, project uh, involved a chap by the name of Harold Orr who's been uh, uh, recognized with the Order of Canada for the work he's done over his lifetime as an engineer around insulation. 
this building has been acknowledged by uh, Passive House Institute as the ancestor of today's uh, uh, Passive House standards. So uh, when we talk about Passive House, when we talk about Passive House Institute building standards, they're not some foreign construct. They're not a, a European uh, idea. They have a lot of their roots right here in Canada. So we are in essence bringing back to Canada uh, the Passive House roots. As I said earlier, Passive House is not just for houses. And just four examples we pulled out of the database. You know, we have, uh, we have tower, uh, we have a community center, we have uh, individual homes. All of them are Passive House. So moving ahead, Arne, if you want to turn your camera on and your, make sure your, uh, your microphone is uh, unmuted, uh, love, to, uh, love to start with a conversation with you. Uh, and I'm hoping that, um, you know, we can start with uh, um, telling us, having you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about Diamond Schmidt, and then we'll get into some questions. So a little background, a little context to, to begin with would be great. Of course. Well, hello, Chris. It's wonderful to join you today on, on Earth Day. And I want to wish everybody a, a happy Earth Day. It's it's really a pleasure to be here on, on you know, a really important day on, on the calendar. Um, but uh, yeah, to start off about myself and, and what I do at Diamond Schmidt, as well as about Diamond Schmidt, um, is so I'm, I'm an architect there. I'm, I'm an associate. And uh, as you mentioned, I, I work at a variety of scales, uh, a variety of projects in the office, um, and one of the one of the big parts of, of what I try and bring to to all of my projects is the idea of sustainability and and a measurable sustainability because I think that's really important in in being able to sort of back up the idea that. What what are our buildings doing? How are they healthier? How are they how are they performing uh, performing well and and uh, bettering the world? And that sort of goes back to uh, sort of the the ethos that we have in the office. Um, and and one of our namesakes, Jack Diamond, he always talks about the fact that uh, it's all about making for a better world. It's about advocacy. It's about making sure that when we build something in a community in a city, it's it's adding to that community, it's advancing that community. It's always uh, looking for, for the best, uh, best sort of uh, parameters for, for what it needs to be. Right, right. And I, I, uh, when we, we uh, had a chat uh, earlier in the week and I was saying, I really enjoy uh, talking with architects and I enjoy talking with urban planners. And I find that, uh, you know, architecture is one of those, um, it's one of those professions that's, that's a big part science, but a big part sort of philosophy and art, uh, the art of the possible and what may be, and, and, you, and, and, and you really do drive what the possibilities are. Yes, and we really enjoy, I mean, the, a big part of it is building an understanding with people, whether it's, it's clients, community stakeholders. I, I think it's all about building an understanding of what, what we want to bring and our vision for that project. And then it's it's also very important for us to, to listen as well as to, to, to talk about our projects and to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what, what I've found uh, through a number of projects is that we start to develop that dialogue, right? Um, I think one of our one of our passive house projects that we have in house, uh, the Alexander Park Passive, right. passive pilot. Um, we're working with Toronto Community Housing as well as uh, one of the the cooperative groups in the Alexander Park uh, neighborhood. Um, and so one of the big parts around this pilot is to build that understanding with the community about what passive house is, um, the the thermal comfort, the and and sort of bringing in a language that that everybody can understand. Because I know you know both me and you and, and, and a lot of people uh, in the industry like to talk about the numbers and they like to talk about, you know, those, those performance metrics that we get really passionate about. Um, but I think it's also sort of what you mentioned, you know, talking about the fact that these are very comfortable buildings, they're resilient right. buildings, all those things that, that people in the community really care about and, and, and want to have that reassurance that what's being built is, 
is is great and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it certainly is is uh, as i said uh, uh uh the best way to sell a passive the passive house building standard is to get someone to visit a passive house uh, whether it be a commercial space or uh or uh, or a house uh i love to see the reaction on people's faces when they come in and we close the door yeah. And the first thing people talk about is how quiet, how beautifully quiet this house is. Yeah. It may be, uh, as my first experience was, tremendous thunderstorm, rain pelting down. We shut the door, completely different world. Or pe people say, silence. where'd the traffic noise go? I, I don't hear anything. It's, it's, uh, it's just a wonderfully quiet environment to be in. Uh, and I, I know from uh, the work we've done with uh, uh, affordable housing providers uh, across Canada, that it's one of the reasons that they, they choose Passive House mm -hmm. uh, is that level of comfort and health that it gives their, uh, their clients. Is that what you're finding with your work with Toronto Community Housing? It is, it is because uh, to a large extent, you know, there, there's conversations about uh, indoor air quality and standards yep. around that. And it's all very much built into the passive house standard. You know, there's there's the the, the mandatory air exchange rates and right. uh, being able to include operable windows, but also very insulated windows. So that you know, if if somebody wants to sit by a window and it's the middle of winter, they're comfortable. They're not shivering. You know, having to put on three layers to sit by a window. It's very comfortable and very very. Uh, you know, you you just get get that comfort that that comes yeah. with yeah. building well and, and building that that great well, thermal envelope that and you you busted one of the uh, passive house myths that's out there is that passive houses can have windows and really big ones oh, they... <laughs> and, and you can open a passive house window uh yes. so, yeah. <laughs> so thanks for doing that but listen just taking a step back you know from mm. a from a high level um what's the role that architecture plays in addressing uh, the climate crisis? What, what are the things that architects are doing, should be doing? Can you give us some thoughts? Well, I think we, we realize uh, that, you know, and, and this is a, a, an industry-wide conversation that, yes. uh, you know, when, when if you live in, in Toronto or Vancouver, you definitely see a lot of cranes in the sky. Um, and, you know, whether you look at any of the kind of world population benchmarks, we're, we're growing very quickly as a, as a country, as a planet. And so we need to build both a lot of housing for people. We need to build, uh, you know, workplaces. And we realize that the, the sort of uh, footprint, energy footprint and, and fossil fuel footprint that we've been putting on the planet uh, simply can't, you know, we can't continue with that uh, going forward. And so we're very much talking about uh, the ways in which we can we can tamp that down, the ways that we can sort of um, the ways that we can measure those and quantify those amounts, so that we we make sure that uh, you know we can build into the future and knowing that that we're not leaving uh, a sort of cost to future generations right. for the that we that we want to build today. Yeah. Um, and those are a lot of the conversation. We get into a lot of detail uh, conversations as well. Um, you know, we're we're always going to webinars and training sessions about new materials, new ways of building, uh, and and you know, talking about thermal bridging, which uh, you know is is basically any projections through your installation that that kind of draw energy out of the building. Uh, and, and that's what we really get passionate about and how to incorporate that into, into our designs. So, yeah, good. Well, uh, people ask me, uh, often, you know, what, how do you start with passive house? How do you start to, to mm -hmm. build a passive house? And we always say the same thing. It starts with good design. It starts with the architecture. Uh, and it's really hard to take, uh, uh, a design for a building to a passive house expert and, and have them turn it into a passive house. It's generally cost prohibitive and, and just not doable. So you're yeah. right. It's about starting at that foundation, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the foundation of a passive house and building out from there. Uh, so passive house traditionally has focused on operational carbon. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that carbon that's needed to uh, to heat or uh, condition uh, the air in the building, keep people uh, uh, comfortable. Um, 
but there is a, a, a growing desire uh, on the part of our members to also mm -hmm. address embodied carbon. And uh, yeah. we are, we have, uh, we have a course, uh, a, a master level course that we have for our members in embodied carbon. And we'll be doing within the next six months, we'll be uh, having significantly more information uh, and calculator uh, for our, uh, for our architects. So embodied carbon is that something that's on the radar for you and 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 what are some of the things you do it is it it, it definitely is and i think i am you know it's it's great to hear the 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 strive that that pacifist canada is doing to to bring in a calculator and bring in bring in those uh, those uh, learning modules as well mm -hmm. Because I think there's a very big conversation around it in the industry right now. Because we we realize we're we're setting ourselves on a good path in terms of uh, energy usage, in terms of those those metrics. But now you know we really need to focus on embodied carbon. And right. you know, where where do the materials or how do the materials that we're using? How are they made? Uh, what impact does that have on on our our planet? Uh, and so. You know, now the the good part is that a lot of uh, manufacturers, a lot of uh, a lot of companies now produce the documentation that you need to calculate embodied carbon. Right. Uh, but what we're finding is you still need to kind of find a cut sheet. You know, set up your own spreadsheet. So you know, a, a calculator and and some of these um, we're finding that there's sort of uh, organizations that are starting to to create those um, easier to reach numbers so you can quickly capture that easily bring it back to to the client or the owner and and they can quickly understand and say oh you know if we go down this pathway that really has quite an intensive carbon intensive uh footprint but we can go in this direction uh and and do something that's better for the planet and it's you know uh still a very good very good product good design but because now that documentation is Mm -hmm. very quickly becoming standard we're seeing right. that as as an easier issue to tackle not not to say that it's completely easy but it but the information's there which i think is is so critical to to having those conversations absolutely it's very it can be very difficult i i think what you're uh you know one of the things that 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 frustrates us from a, a government relations perspective is mm -hmm. uh when we don't have um, a strong enough uh, building code that addresses uh, GHG emissions. Um, you know, we're in, in essence, uh, or 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 uh, even uh, retrofit. Uh, um, we're locking in uh, carbon for the next 30, 40, 50 years, the life of this building. So it sounds to me that you're you're trying to address this in the new build period. You understand that we are. Yes, we're we're trying to to understand that, make sure that we do understand that and, and look at kind of the, the life cycle analysis of, of buildings and basically understanding that, you know, if we, if we expend a certain amount of, of carbon building a building, what mm -hmm. happens at the end of its lifespan as well, yeah. right? We, as architects, I, I think we, we never like to, you know, we never like the idea that our buildings are going to get demolished or that our mm -hmm. designs are, uh, you know, but in a hundred years, a building might need to might need to be replaced. Might need to get a a, a full a full retrofit. Um, you know, wear and tear is is still a thing. Um, and understanding what we can do today to build well, so that those components can either be recycled, reused, or so that that energy expended on a metal panel or whatever it might be does not simply get lost uh, and, down the road. And down yeah. the road. So. so that's that's part of the calculation. So what do we do after the uh, the the uh, the life of that building or the components that goes into the calculations that you do? Yes, yeah, and that's something that we're we're beginning to look at, and we're finding frameworks to actually be able to to calculate that in an easier way. And mm -hmm. because we always find that it is, uh, you know, for for the first project, it's always a little bit more work. You need to kind of build it in. And mm -hmm. then afterwards, once you have that process set up, it's so much easier to replicate afterwards, right? And so right. I think what, what we do really well at, at Diamond Schmidt is that we, we have projects that we say, okay, this one is the one that we're going to, uh, you know, set up this entire system, but this will set us up for success in the future on, on all the rest of the projects that come afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it, you know, 
pays dividends on on all all parts because it's it's an easy to convert easy conversation to have later on when you have that, right. that set up and, and ready to go so so from the work you do at, at Diamond Schmidt and I uh, I don't know if you want to if there's anything you want to elaborate on in terms of uh, of uh, uh, you know your commitment your firm's commitment to uh, to sustainability mm -hmm. um, that's one question I, I I I you know if you want to explore that a little further um, mm -hmm. uh, but I guess it's it's uh, you know I think a question for that people may have is how difficult is it, you know, to stick to that ethos? How, how uh, you, 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 uh, does it, does it make the, the, the company more vulnerable? Uh, do things cost more? How do you deal with that with clients when you're talking about this? Well, I think again, it's all about the, the conversations that we have and, and that yeah. role that we take on as, as sort of, uh, as teachers, as, or, or, you know, being able to to explain why certain concepts are really important to look at, and but the one the one other thing that that in recent years has started to happen is that our, you know our clients are you know much more uh, knowledgeable in in terms of both passive house and and we're having those conversations where where uh, it's it's a really great to see transition where. Previously, we were coming to the table and saying we could do this, we could do that, you know, proposing things. And now we have, you know, clients as well who are coming to us and saying, this is what we want to do. We know you guys, you guys do this well. Let us know how we can accomplish this. And so a lot more of the conversations are about, you know, a, a client will come to us. They might not be knowledgeable in terms of how to achieve a passive house, mm -hmm. but they they know about it. They want to talk about it. And, and it is a goal that they want to put on the table for, for their projects. It sounds like the, uh, the the public relations on behalf of pub, passive houses is, uh, is is something that we need to keep doing and and even ramp up so that you've got more clients coming to you saying this is what we want help us achieve it. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah. but but it's been good because that that um, advocacy has been percolating, and so people mm -hmm. do are aware of it. They they do know what it's about. Um, and I think one of the, and we, we do this in, in all regards is that, you know, most clients, even if they're, even, even if they're a developer who you think builds very often, they're building two buildings a year. Whereas in our office, you know, we have 300 people, we're building a lot of projects in tandem, right? So we have these conversations on a daily basis where our, our you know, clients, or, you know, if you have a community who's building a community center, once in a generation, right? Uh, they hear about something, but they're not going to know the details, and they're looking to us to to guide them on it, which is a, a very nice, you know, it's a great place to be, and it's it's a great feeling to be able to to introduce people to to sustainability if it's the first so, building they're doing, or if yeah. it's the so years. so to 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 the title or to the uh, the job description of scientist, uh, <laughs> philosopher. We also add educator. And, That's which right. Is, yes, <laughs> which is why I've I, I've liked uh, this job because I've uh, I, I work with a lot of people who are quite happy to teach me things on a daily basis. You know, for the record, I'm not an architect, not an engineer. <laughs> they generally don't let me pick a hammer up. Uh, but it's been a it's been a phenomenal uh, it's been a phenomenal exercise. When when you tackle a, a, a passive house uh, project or a uh, client comes to you saying this is the type of standard they want to build to. Is mm -hmm. it? Um, do you do you present them with the trade offs, or are do there have to be trade offs in your mind, or is it uh, the options you present them with? How do you tackle that conversation? That conversation is usually one that we try and find uh, a a good way of explaining why certain certain aspects of the design need to be tailored for. Uh, whether it be sun orientation or you know <laughs> shadowing for, for certain areas, and the the way we usually talk through it is is in presenting a number of options because uh, what we found is that there's not ever one solution to an issue, right? And there's so many aspects that come into play, whether it's you know the programming of a building or you know the the site context of a of a building where you want to be able to be uh, malleable in your approach. And I think a lot of clients, what they, they appreciate is that we come to the table with a number of options to, to find that solution for them. 
Uh, and I think it drives conversation a lot because mm -hmm. when people see a number of options, they're able to kind of, you know, they, they, they suddenly are able to, to pick them apart a little bit and say, oh, well, this one actually also works because I get, you know, this great courtyard in, in the center of my building, or I get, you know, this actually, you know, we're, we're working on, on a new project with, uh, Ottawa community housing. Uh, yes. Gladstone, Gladstone Village. I think this is the the first opportunity we we're having to talk about it. Um, Great. And it, you know, we're we're in very early design, so we're just talking. You know, very early big moves that we're talking about, but um, in presenting a number of very early options and talking about uh, you know building envelope area to square to building square footage, for example, which is such a critical factor in in passive house design. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to present numerous options and that starts to kind of, it starts a conversation where, where they're able to say, well, we actually like this aspect of this option and the option still works. It's not that we, we're not limited to presenting one option and saying it's, you know, take it or yeah. leave it. This is the only way to do it. So it's either this or nothing. Yeah, no. And I, I think I, what I hear from designers is they, they appreciate uh, the passive house uh, process in that uh, it's outcomes based. It's mm -hmm. uh, it, it tells you what you need to achieve at the outcome. But in terms of materials and design, uh, we leave it up to the professionals to figure out how what what works for uh, for their clients. But yes, yeah, to, yeah. Get, to get to the end to get that uh, you know that fifteen kilowatts uh, uh, per hour per uh, per square meter squared. Uh, that's what we care about. Yes. Air yeah. exchanges, et cetera. But how you get there is up to you and, and the client. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I find that that also makes for a, a easier way to explain the concept, uh, you know, in those beginning conversations, okay. because it's all yeah. about, that, you know, the numbers that you're getting out of the building. Yes, there's tons of systems behind it. There's tons of, you know, uh, considerations behind it. But at the end of the day, it's really that performance value that we're that we're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not that it's it's hemmed in in any other way. It's about reaching yeah. that performance, and there's a lot of a lot of ways to to do that. Great, you know the 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 800 pound gorilla always in the room when we talk about uh, net zero building uh, mm -hmm. is uh, I call it the you know the, the the green building myth or the green premium myth that there is a a significant cost. Uh, to building uh, uh, to uh, to net zero or to passive house. What's your experience been in that? Well, I think that's that's actually a big conversation as well in our industry because that is mm -hmm. sort of uh, it, it's it's a bit of a it it it's a myth, right? That it it costs yeah. uh, a lot to build passive. Uh, and actually, the best analogy that I've heard from from one of my colleagues in the industry is that basically. If you start with the goal of passive house from day one, it's not going to cost more than than you know, or or there might be a little bit of a of a cost difference, but it's not going to be a you know a fifty percent cost increase to go to passive house. It's only if you know you're ninety percent through the design and you decide, <laughs> okay, well now I need to, because you're basically retrofitting your design at that point, right? Right. And right. So I, it's, it's always starting those conversations early. And if, you know, if, if a client is interested in pursuing passive house, it's really front loading that conversation to saying, well, these are the things that we should be looking at now so that we don't have to mm -hmm. sort of try and fit them in at the end because it's much more challenging. Right. Which is true to, to architecture and construction, right? The later, the later you, you push anything, you know, whether it's a feature stair or, or, you know, or a, a a passive house certification, anything you bring in later in the project, it's going to cost you more. So it's, really, the early days are are where yeah. when we want to start those conversations and and they're yeah no and, and it's 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 what I've heard from uh, uh, general contractors. It's what I've you know big and small. It's it's what I've heard from uh, building designers from clients mm -hmm. who who you know some said their first project. Uh, because everybody was learning was a little more expensive, but it was the, you know, the additional expense was, was recovered very quickly because of low energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but now I'm hearing even first time builders, uh, designers are not having 
those issues. Uh, I'd like to say in part because they've taken some wonderful Passive House uh, Canada training, and we have a great community of people who help them solve problems. Um, but it's just it's just not that that's a that that really is a myth that green it's a myth. premium yeah. Uh, myth yeah good thanks exactly thanks so. and, and, and that's what you know unfortunately uh there are people who have that in their heads and we're all here today to uh to say that's not that's not true yeah uh, not anymore yeah, exactly so it's yeah. good uh, the um can you take a couple of minutes and just, uh, you know, I know it's early days for a number of uh, mm -hmm. Passive House projects that Diamond Schmidt is involved with, but can you take a minute to walk us through some of the ones that you're really excited about? Just yeah, definitely. even verbally fill us in on what you're doing. Yes, because um, they're, they're early days, so they're very yep. much, uh, you know, they're, they're programming diagrams at the moment and, and sort of massing, so not... Um, and, and we usually like to present kind of finished imagery. To, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, we have three, three passive house projects on the go that are, you know, full, full bore ahead and others on, on the table. Um, the one that I just mentioned, uh, we're, we're very excited about is uh, Gladstone Village with, with Ottawa Community Housing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a, a, a high rise development with 304 uh, units in in the project. Fantastic. Uh, all about all about family. Uh, all about having you know between uh, zero you know bachelor units through to one two three four and even five bedroom units. Uh, so really quite a quite a good range, um, and it ties together well with what we've been what we've been promoting as well in terms of looking at at families living in in uh, high-rise buildings how to how to design for families in high-rise living um, and that also you know it helps with the performance factor when when that happens as well mm -hmm. um, and so we're working with with a really great engaged client you know from day one uh, we've really been having uh, great conversations about uh, performance passive house, looking at uh, potentials for district energy, you know, having really, really good conversations about how do we reach those uh, energy efficiency metrics? Uh, how, do we, how do we make sure that we're setting this project off on the best, absolute best mm -hmm. foothold? Um, and so, you know, we're early days, but we're, we're excited to talk about that more in the, in the months ahead. Um, and so that project is slated for completion in, in 2023. Great. Uh, and that's, the not, other that's not too far. That's not too it's far not away. Too far away. So we're we're excited. It's 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 a quick project, but very ambitious and a lot of uh, very very dedicated people. So just, um, we're it, we try and try and wangle a ribbon cutting invitation for Passive House Canada. We'd love to be there. We're we're gonna try. We're gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. And, 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 and go ahead. Well, the the other one that I've I've spoken about before at at the Passive House uh, conference uh, mm -hmm. last year was is the the Alexander Park uh, right. Passive House pilot. Um, we're working there with uh, Toronto Community Housing, and again, very very engaged uh, group of people, a great client to be working with because we're having uh, you know great conversations about energy efficiency about water retention on site because that's that's another part of the equation where um mm -hmm. the city of toronto is you know they, they they have their step requirements and any city organizations have to be ahead of the requirements that that private development needs to be uh needs to be uh following and what toronto community housing has actually done is even uh kind of front loaded that of being ready so that when they have to build their first uh you know large scale development uh, you know, they're ready to go. We've gone through the process and we've, we've had the time to, to understand uh, and, and develop a, a good project there. Hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've had great community outreach, talking about past posts, talking, you know, it's very much uh, being talked about uh, in the community, in the city, and we're seeing it as, as a great uh, conversation piece to, to talk about what passive house is. Um, and a big part of it is explaining and saying it's not a new standard. It's not new by any by any means. Right. It's, it's been around for a long time, um, and it's and it's a good 
a good standard to follow for for housing. So mm -hmm. uh, well, that sounds good. And what what's the reaction from people when they hear about passive house? The the community members when they hear, or even you know potential people who might be living in these uh, in these homes. Yeah, I I think the initial. Uh, you know, the initial response was a bit mixed because people didn't know what it was exactly. And so, you know, when there's something new, it's always, you know, you have to talk yeah. about it. You have to kind of talk about the fact that it's, uh, you know, it's it's a standard that's all about on the base level, you know, there's the energy requirements, but what that means is that there's that, ther you know, thermal comfort. When you come home, your, your, your house is always warm. Uh, you know, you have windows, you have, large windows um <laughs> but the the other part that was really important to the community was resiliency right you know, and the fact that you know we were able to to speak to the fact that um some of our our colleagues for example e era architects has done some studies in terms of resiliency and when you build to passive that you know if the power goes out as as happens every once in a while um you know we i i think a lot of us in in southern Ontario, remember the the power outage in in 2013 and sort of mm -hmm. middle of winter, um, that you know your your home is going to stay warm, right? It's it's yeah. very important to, to the community to to un that that's such an underlying part of of the questions that we were asked as well. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so there again, people aren't necessarily uh, concerned about or interested in how many uh, kilowatts per hour of energy we're using or how many times the air is exchanged. They want to know that their house is is comfortable and it's quiet and it's resilient. Those fundamental exactly. things. Yeah, those fundamental we things. And it's uh, it's great because on that project, uh, I've kind of been able to talk about the two sides. You know, uh, one is very much talking about how that how how a passive house is is this comfortable building and on the other side talking you know in the conference more about the numbers more about how we achieve that from a, a performance side and how we built it so it's been sure sure it's been an excellent uh excellent uh, Di involvement. diamond schmidt's involved in in a community center there must be some challenges there tell us a little bit about that project Yes, so that is uh, on the West Coast, um, and so that is going to be a community center for uh, for Maripol. And so, essentially, what uh, what we're doing there is that it is going to be a um, a six thousand uh, square meter uh, community center for Maripol Oak Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's going to have a mix of uh, childcare spaces. Uh, there's going to be support spaces. Uh, an outdoor pool, and so it's it's got very lofty goals in terms of uh, passive house certification. It's it's really going for uh, that's part of the my understanding is that that's part of the mandate. Uh, not working on it personally, but it's 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 very much being talked about in our office, um, and it's also going for for lead gold as well as a zero carbon standard under under the the CAGBC. So very very lofty goals for it um the the team is very engaged the clients very engaged it's you know it's we're excited about about using it as a model for for community Absolutely. centers in our office you'll have multiple challenges with a community center because of all the uses and just the the form of the building so we we look forward to checking back later on to uh, maybe some lessons learned and uh that definitely there with, with the the broader passive house community so we're getting close to question time, but you know, uh, one of the reasons that we started talking with Diamond Schmidt is uh, a few months ago, um, 25 of your architects took Passive House Canada training and are now certified uh, Passive House designer consultants. Can you um, just talk about why that was important for, for Diamond Schmidt to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I have to do a little self promotion and say I was one of the 25 very proud to be uh, to be certified as well. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so the reason Diamond Schmidt found that it was really important to do this is because, you know, when we go to various conferences or we talk to our, our industry peers, uh, you, you know, the, this was very clear on the horizon that, you know, uh, sustainability is going to be very, very important. Um, and there's, you know, the, the passive house standard puts that into a framework that is understood. Mm -hmm. you know, 
and, and you're able to build that forward. And so I think uh, there was a lot of interest in our office by, by you know, and, and there's, you know, even more people interested in, in taking the training, but, uh, you know, we, we really felt that we had to do this as a, a group. We wanted to do it as a group because it, it fundamentally changes the conversation in the office when you have such a, such a large contingent of people who have become trained and, and, and certified. Great. And so, you know, we're, we're not, not every project right now is, is passive house certified yet, but the lessons that we've learned there, and I, and I think this is a key takeaway, can be applied to other projects. You know, mm-hmm. you, when you understand how to detail well, avoid thermal bridging, you know, it sticks in your mind. You, you, right. you know, when you're, when you're developing other details, you realize, you know, this is how we can improve this, make this perform better. Um, and it pays dividends for, for those buildings, those clients, because they, they get, they get better buildings as well. You, you simply get better buildings. If you, you have that, you may not be going after a passive house, uh, a quality of build or level of build, but you certainly get a better building. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so and, we were very, very focused on kind of front loading our, our own office and our own knowledge so that when mm-hmm. we, when we're going out into the world, we're, we're speaking about uh, building the best buildings, which, which we always strive to do. So. Excellent. Excellent. And we know um, for those, you know, those companies that do a majority of their business in the, in the GTHA or Toronto, um, they're they're very aware of uh, tier four with the Toronto Green mm-hmm. Building Standard, uh, and uh, for all intents and purposes, to get to that tier four has got to yeah. be the Passive House, you know, Institute uh, Building Standard. You can do one, exactly. two, three. You can use other standards, but number four, you've it's got to be got to be PHI. So. Exactly. Uh, so that's uh, that is sort of future proofing. We'll say uh, a lot of the work that you're doing. Yes. Yes. That's good. Well, listen. Before we we go to question, this has been great, and and uh, you know we could we could keep talking for a long time. But before we go to questions, uh, have I missed anything, Iron? Is there anything? Uh, uh, is there any comments you want to make? Uh, I mean, I think just underscoring the importance of of building better and understanding how to build better. And I think uh, that's where, you know, all of our dialogue with, with yourself and, and everyone at, at the Pacifos Institute um, mm-hmm. has been really great. And with Pacifos Canada has been really, really important. Um, and just to reinforce that it's always a learning process. I, I've always found in architecture, you know, it's always a learning process. There is always something new in it. And it makes for new and exciting buildings. So yeah, well, very good. Well, congratulations on 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 becoming a designer consultant yourself, and to the the Thank rest you. of the team at Diamond Schmidt. And uh, we certainly were excited to see uh, 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 your firm come forward. You know, as a contingent, uh, I really love the idea that you know you've got that study group together, and it, and it's it it can be a culture changer within an organization when you have that number of people all do it together. So congratulations. Congratulations. So uh, Deb, uh, Deb Knopp, uh, we have questions. I can see them popping up in the comments section. <laughs> uh, we had some e- emailed to us, I understand. Do you want to facilitate that for us, Deb? Sure, um, absolutely. We do have a few questions here. I wonder, we have uh, Brian Millard, if you're still on the line here. You had several questions. I'm happy to read them off. But if you would like to unmute yourself and ask Arn these questions yourself, you're more than welcome to. Um, we can do that. And uh, if not, I'll give you a chance to uh, unmute. If you don't, otherwise I'll go ahead. Sure, I've never been shy. <clears throat> <Okay>. <laughs> so all my uh, questions, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. This has been excellent. All my questions relate to ICF. So the details are in the chat there. Yeah. So thoughts around uh, yeah uh, thoughts around ICF Arn if you have any and there's uh, I see Brian has commented about uh, carbon capture technology and cement any expertise any comments in in that area I mean I think it's it's a really uh, it's a critical conversation that we're having because I I, I mean especially in in southern Ontario um, you know concrete is concrete is is prevalent in, in all of our buildings. And I think it's 
it's a, a, a big conversation that we need to have. Uh, we explored ICF panels uh, on the, the Alexander Park project, uh, and we ended up uh, moving away from it uh, and going towards uh, more traditional stick built construction because we could use FSC certified wood. You know, there's all the kind of uh, more, more uh, cert certified sourcing that, right. that we have there. Um, yeah. In terms of ICAF, I mean, the benefit of that is that you get into more modularity, you get into the speed of construction, which is sometimes hard to argue against, but I think uh, we need to further understand how we can actually mitigate the, the CO2 impacts of concrete, whether mm -hmm. it's an ICF or whether it's in any of our other projects. I think that's right. a, a big conversation that that needs to happen. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm certainly in no position uh, to uh, evaluate uh, carbon capture technologies when it comes to uh, to cement. Um, I know, as I said uh, earlier, that that our folks are more and more interested in in the overall carbon footprint of the building. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, um, but I, I, you know, I think we'll see in months and years ahead, um, the, you know, new technologies coming to. Uh, uh, to coming to uh, concrete, uh, coming to cement, so that it uh, has a reduced carbon footprint and, and maybe become a little bit more uh, uh, more green, if you yeah, want and, and, a phrase. And, and I mean, you know, necessity is is the mother of invention, right? I I, I think we realize that you know there new technologies need to be embraced to to mm -hmm. pursue carbon capture. Yeah, uh, in concrete, and I think it's it's promising. It, it'll it'll definitely be promising in the years ahead. So yeah, yeah. So uh, Deb, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I'll just fire through a few rest of these that we have on the chat, and if you had any other questions, please feel free to put your hand up as well. Okay. Um, with with the quality of the, this is for Arn with the quality of triple pane window technology improving, does the percentage of window space change in passive house? I. Uh, it does, it does change because I mean, between triple glazing uh, and as well as fiberglass frames, we're seeing the performance of, of windows uh, continually improving, continually improving, as well as becoming more accessible in terms of cost as well, right? Because yeah. uh, I think that's, that's another factor that, that always plays into, into any building development and any, any uh, conversation. And so, yes, because the, the, the windows that, that we're able to choose and, and the glass that we're able to choose is becoming better performing as we move forward, uh, we're able to, to use greater, you know, greater glazing. Um, but I think the other aspect which uh, always has to be discussed is that it's also uh, a matter of uh, using, you know, what we now have are very sophisticated energy modeling software uh sun you know sun shading studies that we can do to actually use those windows where they need to go as well um because you know you always want to be bringing in daylight you want to be bringing the 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 right the right amount of daylight being able to to give people access to views and i don't think that uh as architects and as designers we would ever want to sacrifice that um but i think it's also a matter of recognizing you know, if, if you're putting in a, a tiny little window that faces an alleyway, you know, when we didn't talk about energy, it was easy to put that window in and say, oh, you know, it, it's, it's there. But now I think we're, we're able to have much more pointed conversations and saying, if you really need that window, yes, it can be put in. But if not, it's, it's benefiting you to not have it there, um, mm -hmm. especially if, you know, it's in a storage room and you're going to put a shelf in front of it anyway. So. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> And I will, uh, Deb, I will uh, give a shout out to Fenestration Canada. I see they're on our call today. Uh, and uh, just a shout out to their members uh, across Canada who are really innovating and building those passive mm -hmm. house, those really high quality, high performance windows uh, here in Canada. Uh, exciting times ahead, I think, for many component manufacturers in Canada. Uh, I know uh, uh, Arne mentioned Toronto Community Housing. Um, they will be um, 
retrofitting a number of their towers in the next few years and, and purchasing literally hundreds of thousands of high performance windows. Uh, um, hopefully uh, we will uh, expect them to buy those from Canadian manufacturers. Uh, so it's exciting times for the, for the window manufacturing mm -hmm. community here in Canada. And we're proud to support uh, Fenestration Canada uh, and their members as they tackle uh, uh, their their technical challenges, but we know they can do it. They're doing it already. A number of their members are doing it already, and 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 turning out uh, some really uh, top notch windows and doors. So another question, Deb. Yeah, a question from Hans. Have you found much pushback from GCs and sub trades in adapting to the requirements of passive house? Mm -hmm. It's it's a good question, um, and we're sort of early early days on uh, on uh, a number of projects before construction. But I think it's uh, what we've found is that uh, we've been working with one of our our construction managers, and you know it, they were they were on board with the client before we were even hired on. And passive house was a metric that. That is that was always on the table, um, and so I think it's uh, you know they haven't you know we need to build that familiarity with with uh, the passive house standard, but at the same time there's a lot of people there who recognize that it's going to be a, an industry standard and uh, a standard that they need to build on on projects moving forward, and so I think they're seeing it more as uh, you know, if they're able to, to get in early on the early passive house projects, they're going to gain benefits in the years to come because they're going to understand it. They're going to, you know, leapfrog over, over uh, you know, contractors who might be reticent and say, well, I just want to, you know, do what I've been doing. Um, and so I think, no, I, I think we've actually found that, that they're quite embracing of it. They want to understand it because they realize it's, it's, where the industry is going there's mm -hmm. there's no there's no ignoring it <laughs> right can i uh, let me just jump in for a second deb uh in talking with uh um building designers and uh, and gcs across the country you know anything new uh it's human nature to be a little worried when you face mm -hmm. anything new uh but you know generally what happens what we find with gcs is they say you know give us the plans we can build it we can, you know, yeah. what do you want? We'll build it. it this ah. is, and, and we like to say at Passive House, you know, it's Passive House is not rocket science. It's building science, but it's not rocket science. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we have a trades program. We offer uh, trades people. It's three days long. We can teach people, uh, you know, all they need to know as trades people, all they'll need to know about Passive House in a matter of days, you know, a couple of, couple of days in classroom and then another day with some hands-on, uh, playing around with different tapes and sidings and what whatnot, uh, but the, I think the most telling comment we get in our trades program is about ninety minutes in. You get, you know, skilled tradespeople who are saying, "Oh, is this all you mean? Is this all it is?" Right? Like they get it. It's this is not rocket science. So yeah. uh, the pushback is when people don't know anything about it, but as soon as they understand what the, the principles of passive house. You know, any any skilled tradesperson gets it, and and GCs who are really focused on building the best building they can, um, they're all on board. Yeah. Good. Another question there, Deb. Yeah, we've got a few more, and then please let the questions keep coming in. I know we're running out of time, but we're happy to answer them offline as well. Okay. Um, what do you suggest for residential single home project modular wall panels build in factory or build on site? Oh, mm -hmm. that's a very good question. I mean, it's it it's a very good. I I'm always supportive of it because I mean, in in all aspects, what what's most important is the quality of the build, right? And so, um, from my limited experience on on prefab elements, is that you you get that quality control in factory before it arrives on site. Um, rather than, you know, the quality control happening on site, which can sometimes get you benefits in terms of timing and in terms of, uh, you know, that, that uh, you know, when things are delivered, you know, they're, they're ready to go. Um, 
so I think I think there's definite benefits to, to that. Not having used any uh, just yet myself on, on any projects, it is something that I'm interested in, in learning more about as well. But from what I've heard from other, uh, other architects, other builders, mm -hmm. um, is that there's definitely a, a, a benefit there because you're doing everything in factory. You can test it there, you can do everything, bring it on site and the site assembly is, is much faster. Um, right. And so, you know, you get benefits, uh, benefits there as well. And uh, I've, I've heard good things about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'll, uh, I'll throw something in, you know, for, for consideration by maybe developers as well, is that if you're in a mm -hmm. city that has congested streets, the last thing, you know, the mayor and council want to hear is that a major thoroughfare is going to lose a lane. Uh, mm -hmm. to your project for the next two years so you can haul buckets of concrete up 60 stories. Uh, you know, they can take a lesson from uh, European cities and look at modular because it's much faster to put together on site and that that lane doesn't have to be shut down for uh, as many years. Um, anecdotal, yeah. perhaps, but I think it makes sense. Uh, and I think it's something that 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 planners and, and elected politicians are would love. Yeah. And I know there's a few examples where, you know, the structure went up, the, the exterior cladding was all uh, done in factory, modular, produced, brought on site, and the cladding went up very, very quickly. So you went from, you know, the structure went up quickly, your cladding went up quick, quickly, and you're starting on finishes, which, which also uh, has a great, great yeah. effect as well on on. on perception of how quick a development is, is going up. So absolutely. That's uh, very good. Deb, I know we're six minutes past the hour. Do we have time for one more question or what's your sense? Sure. Sure. Here's a broader question. And then again, the rest we can um, answer separately. Uh, do you have any feedback from occupants or performance metrics from your passive house buildings? Maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, I, you're still well, I can... in your passive house. So go okay. ahead. Not, not yet on our passive house buildings, but uh, you know, uh, Diamond Schmidt has been building uh, very, very uh, sustainable buildings, which have strived to reach uh, very good, uh, you know, performance metrics in the past. And uh, we always keep a catalog. We we have this uh, this software called Ecometrics, where we were able to to plug in our our energy models from our energy modelers. Um, and, you know, we, we try and do whenever owners are interested, we try and, and go back and, and benchmark those projects afterwards as well, when possible. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've had really good results in that regard where um, conversations with owners of, of, you know, whether they be lead platinum buildings or net zero buildings, uh, there's always great feedback because not only is it a, a great building that they're getting, they're getting, you know, a great story behind it as well about how they're being leaders uh, in, in that, in the sustainability world. And I have no doubt that, you know, our passive house buildings are, are going to receive the same uh, sort of feedback uh, when, when they're completed. Yeah. Good to hear. Uh, and I know uh, again, you know, thanks to, uh, the architectural firms that are pushing for uh, net zero, for per passive house uh, uh, standards. There's a few uh, on our webinar right now listening in. So they know who they are, but and I know who they are, and I wanna thank them for uh, their commitment to uh, PHI standards. So uh, I think we'll leave it there. There's a number of questions that we haven't got to in the chat and by email, and we'll answer them to the best of our ability, um, but, uh, uh, Arne, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank Diamond Schmidt. Thank you for being here today and talking uh, about uh, your firm and, and your commitment to uh, uh, to Passive House, the Passive House standard. Thank you uh, to you and the your 24 colleagues for passing the uh, exam. I, I hope it wasn't too, uh, too tough for you all, uh, but uh, great to have you on board. We look forward to you joining the uh, uh, passive house community and, and and I really look forward to Diamond Schmidt presenting on on these buildings uh, at future symposiums. Chris, I, I must say it's been an absolute pleasure to to talk to you today and and I mean a great audience that that we had. so i'm I'm very excited that we had we had so many people uh, joining us today. Oh. Uh, and, and I would look forward to to talking with you more and I know a few of my colleagues at the office would love to talk about their their projects as well. so. 
Well, as they move them down the uh, the pipe, we'll be in touch. And I again wanted to thank everyone who's joined us today. Uh, one of the exciting things that's happened uh, since I became CEO just 12, 13 months ago is the growth of interest in Central Canada, Ontario, and Quebec, especially. Uh, that uh, that you know we know BC is the the ancestral home, we'll say, of Passive House Canada. Uh, but the growth in Ontario especially has been fantastic. Uh, you know, not a day goes by where uh, a municipal government or a, a developer or uh, someone uh, hasn't reached out to us to learn more about Passive House and Passive House Canada. So uh, I think that uh, I think that that you know those who have taken the training are, are well positioned as this market grows, as people understand what they have to do to meet uh, tough. Uh, uh, building standards that the City of Toronto is putting in front of them. And as we see more and more emphasis on uh, retrofitting to high energy standards. So the, the Passive House Enerfit project, we'll have more about that uh, in, in the weeks ahead. Um, there's just so many opportunities for practitioners. Uh, you don't have to be BC based anymore to take advantage of Passive House. Uh, I, I, uh, I expect to see an explosion of Passive House uh, uh, construction design and construction here in Ontario over the next two to three years, based on the inquiries we're getting, based on government policy that we're helping to shape. Uh, but very exciting times, and I'll, I'll conclude by saying uh, very necessary uh, in these times of climate crisis. Uh, and it is uh, so great to chat with you on Earth Day and to hear about the projects that uh, Diamond Schmidt is involved with. And I will uh, go back to sharing my screen. I think I have uh, one slide or two left and then we'll let folks get on their way. So thank you very much, Arn. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Well, I think I did it better this time and shared the right screen. I simply wanted to move along and we had talked about training at Passive House Canada. And I, you know, training is one of the, the, the biggest things we do in terms of advocacy, because we find that, that once you've taken some Passive House training, maybe you haven't become a designer consultant, you've taken an introductory course uh, to learn more about Passive House, uh, but we certainly find that that people become real advocates for Passive House. A couple of uh, training courses that we have coming up in May and June, uh, we have the Pathway to Passive House Designer Consultant Certification that starts in early May. Um, but if you're simply interested in learning some of the fundamentals of Passive House, I would highly recommend our, our introduction to Passive House high performance buildings. Uh, we have that course uh, is uh, uh, launching on June the 1st. So uh, all of this is available over the internet. Uh, it's all there for you to uh, explore on our website. Uh, and uh, we really look forward to, uh, to seeing you online, to meeting you in person when we can. And uh, from all of us at Passive House Community, thank you for being here today. From all of us in the in the in at Passive House Canada, the organization, thank you for being here. We'll see you in a month at our next building conversations. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>